All right, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to all the attendees and to our panelists. This will be a discussion about House Bill 544, which uh, as you know, it deals with uh, critical race theory in, in government. So uh, we're gonna try to keep this fast paced. Uh, we know that representatives have very busy schedules. So we wanna give them as much useful information as possible in a short amount of time. So uh, with that, I'm Keith Ammon. I'm the prime sponsor of the bill. I represent Hillsborough District 40 in New Hampshire and I live in New Boston. And uh, let's let's go around uh, clockwise from here. We'll go, uh, Christian. You want to just give a brief introduction? Sure. I'm I'm Christian Watson. I'm a I'm a aspiring political commentator. Um, I'm here because I had an experience in collegiate debate where I went up against critical race theory every single day, and so I'm happy to be here to share my experience and hopefully provide some value to you guys. Great, Mr. Rufo. Yeah, I'm Chris Rufo. Uh, I'm the director of the Center on Wealth and Poverty at Discovery Institute in Seattle. Uh, I'm a contributing editor at uh, Manhattan Institute City Journal, and then this year I'm also a colleague of uh, my friend Mike Gonzalez I'm a, as a visiting uh, scholar at Heritage Foundation and uh, Domestic Policy Studies. Great, and I know many of you are doctors, and I'm calling you Mister, so forgive me if uh, if I if I messed messed it up. I think it's uh, Dr. Lindsay. Is that correct? You can call me Mister if you want. Um, okay. You're not trying to insult me, so oh, uh, <laughs> so. My name is James Lindsay. I run a, a, a company. I'm the founder of a company called New Discourses. New Discourses is dedicated to studying critical theory in all of its manifestations, including critical race theory, and to disseminating information about that more or less as quickly and thoroughly as possible. Um, so I study this. I write about this constantly. This is my subject area. So I, in some sense, I've introduced myself before as a kind of world leading expert in critical race theory and critical theory in general among people who don't believe it, uh, because the people who do believe it, probably some of them will know it better than I do. Great. And Mr. Dr. Gonzalez. I, I am also a Mr. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, uh, my name is Mike Gonzalez. I'm a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. I also wrote a book uh, last year on, on identity politics, in which I, to which I devoted a chapter to, to critical theory, which is the father of uh, critical race theory. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to help in any capacity that I can. I just finished another book in which I described Chris Rufo as a happy warrior in one man demolition force against critical race theory. And last but not least, Dr. Carlin, who lives in Merrimack, uh, New Hampshire, just a, two towns away from where I live. So. I, I do indeed. And, and my doctor is only relevant because I'm an organizational psychologist. I spent the last 10 years of my career trying to build better work environments where people can be productive and happy and all of those good things. Um, I started encountering critical race theory in the work environment a couple of years ago uh, and really have been uh, immersed in it for the last two years, pretty in depth, fighting back mm -hmm. against it because I think it's incredibly harmful to individuals and to organizations on a psychological level and also in terms of uh, productivity. Okay, that's great. Uh, that's introductions out of the way. Let's have uh, someone volunteer to give a 30 second overview of what critical race theory is and we'll just kind of cue that up and then we'll go into Christian's experience. Who'd like to do that? Mm -hmm. James's book is selling slightly better than mine, so I'll let him go first. Yeah, I think we should do James. <laughs> Okay. I don't, I don't know if I can do this in 30 seconds, but I'll try. Critical race theory is a way of viewing the relationship between race, racism, and power that evolved out of critical legal studies at Harvard Law, following specifically the, the theory of Derek Bell um, and his student, Kimberly Crenshaw. They're credited with creating it. It holds a number of core assumptions that define it better uh, than anything else. One of those is calling into question the foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment, rationalism, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. A second one is that it is uh, skeptical of the idea of rights, in particular individual rights, and it favors the idea of something that in my opinion doesn't exist, which is group rights. Um, Third, it has the core assumption that racism is the ordinary state of affairs in society and is present in all institutions and interactions, and it's up to a person called a critical race theorist to be able to find it. Fourth, it assumes that uh, racism doesn't merely go away. In fact, it's, it's usually just covered up. It is in the best interests of people who say that they're fighting racism to say that they're fighting racism, so they rarely have uh, innocent or beneficial motivations. That's called interest convergence thesis, uh, which came from Derek Bell in the 1970s. And uh, I guess finally it forwards the idea that, that 
the claims upon the truth are contingent upon one's identity and applications of political power, and it therefore advocates the use of storytelling, counter storytelling, and narrative weaving in reply to uh, evidence, uh, empiricism, and like I said, enlightenment, rationalism, legal reasoning, and neutral principles of constitutional law, which it questions fundamentally. So that's a general quick definition. That's uh, that could, sounds like you could write a book about that. It's a very interesting topic. <laughs> Did write a so, book about it. So, <laughs> Carlin, uh, do you want to talk about how you you and Christian met and yeah. uh, just queue up? So I, I want to do I want to do just a little preface to this. So I, I'm very interested in how things practically manifest in the real world. And so I want to give you all an example of how critical race theory has manifested in terms of organizational training. So I'm going to share my desktop really quickly. Um, these are images of uh, a training that took place at Coca-Cola, but more broadly on LinkedIn Learning. Um, this training launched last June. It's been used not only by Coca-Cola, but by some of the biggest companies in the world. And this is this is the type of training you're going to encounter in organizations when they're doing training based on critical race theory. This is all based on Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility. And I bring that book up specifically because I know for a fact, that book has been used to train teachers in the Bedford schools. I've heard about it directly from the teachers who experienced it. So some of the things that you're going to learn as an employee when you're doing this type of training is that to be white is to be, uh, or to be less white rather, is to be less oppressive, to be less arrogant, to be less certain, less defensive, less ignorant, more humble, to listen, to believe, to break with apathy, break with white solidarity. You're going to hear things like in the United States and other Western nations, white people are socialized to feel that they are inherently superior and research shows that uh, people by the ages of three or four start to start to become racist and I know that Chris Rufo has some interesting examples that he can talk about about how this manifests in schools he's done a lot of work with that and then you are literally going to be told to try to be less white and so this is this is the type of stuff that's going to happen in organizations when they're doing this training and one of the reasons that I really wanted to have Christian on the call is not only that I think he is a really smart young man, but because I do think it's important when we're having conversations about race like this to hear from people, frankly, that look like Christian that have also had adverse experiences with this ideology, because what you're going to find in this ideology is not, it is not about race. It is not about fighting racism. It is not about fairness. It is not about justice. It is only about power. That is what it's about. And so um, with that, I, I'd love to, for you guys to hear a few minutes um, listening to Christian and hear, talk, hear his experience in college. All right. I, can I go? Go ahead. Well, um, first of all, Carlin, thank you. And thank you guys for having me here. I'm a lot of people on this panel I'm aware of, and I'm very honored to be able to speak in front of you about this experience. Um, so really, my experience with critical race theory came in my interaction with collegiate debate. You know, when I was a freshman in college, I can easily remember the first time I walked into the debate teacher's office and I told him exactly, you know, what kind of philosophers I like. And I said, well, you know, I like Ayn Rand and Frederick Hayek and people like that. And he said, oh, really? And his eyes just went very big. And I didn't understand why he was so shocked at that moment. But as I continued to have more experiences with him and the team, I think I began understanding more. Um, I, had, I, went into, I went into collegiate debate with the idea that we would be all in, involved in a collaborative, intimate collaborative process that is, of course, in a competitive structure, but nonetheless, collaborative process that is primarily aimed at finding the truth. I had a very sort of, I would say, Aristotelian, meaning the understanding that Aristotle and the ancient Greeks had of the truth of being able to go about and finding it through logical inquiry. Unfortunately, that wasn't the environment that I got into. Um, when I, I remember at our first debating tournament, most of the topics were not even topics that were predicated upon, um, you know, looking at information objectively and empirically and citing studies. Most of the topics were topics that were based on the ideas of identity. And most of the teams that were interacting with those topics were arguing almost entirely from the, their identity. So most teams in the collegiate debate that I did, and for those of you who aren't familiar with, with um, debate, there are two kinds. There's parliamentary debate and there's policy debate. I did parliamentary debate. Both of them have vestiges of critical race theory enmeshed in them. Um, parliamentary has more so given the unstructured form of it. So one team that I went up against was talking about how it was essential, and they use the word, they use a lot, a lot of jargon. It was essential to the being of African-Americans to support a certain thing. Now, look, I was a freshman starry-eyed guy. I had no idea what any of this meant. I'm like, that's, that's very odd of you. 
And then, so when I got back to the team prep room, they said, oh yeah, that's, that comes from a Foucault, uh, from a Foucaultian um, theorist called Mbembe. I'm like, huh, what? I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea what all these terms are. That's when I really began looking into the nitty gritty of what a lot of collegiates, judges and teams alike were um, estimating arguments with and judging arguments by. And I realized that critical race there was actually quite a very, you know, um, full-fledged um, pernicious force in the system. So I was arguing things that, of course, were against this kind of idea. I was always arguing cases that were predicated upon individualism, um, libertarianism, uh, libertarian conservatism, a mixture of both. And I had uh, a debate coach advise me, he said, Christian, conservative cases can't win in this space. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, most judges here are Christian. I'm just telling you, debate is a left-wing practice. Now, collegiate debate is not billed as a left-wing practice, and it's not thought of typically as a left-wing practice or anything like that when you go into it. But just to hear an academic, a PhD, admit, to, admit that to me and tell me that only a certain kind of um, viewpoint was accessible and allowed in a, in a space in which um, viewpoints are meant to be challenged showed me that modern-day collegiate debate is not about challenging anything. And it's about reasserting and re-implementing the preconceptions one has if they have this certain persuasion. So um, I just, I kept watching this thing go, go forward and I kept seeing teams, including the people on my team, make arguments entirely from who they were. If they were disabled, they would like say, you know what? I'm not going to worry about the proposition, um, the uh, the topic of the debate. I'm going to talk about me being disabled and how I'm under attack by systems of oppression. And they would just completely not only use the topic of debate just to go for that. And I, I know James mentioned storytelling. There are there are tactics in the debate called retelling time, where people from certain ethnic minorities have the ability to go back and say, hey, we're going to retell time through our experience right here. We're going to reinvent time to correct for the supposed harms that happened to us. I mean. If in all honesty, looking back on it in retrospect, collegiate debate is nothing more than I would contend a, a full-fledged training course and how to be a good critical theorist and how to be a poor critical thinker. So, and that's one of the reasons I think why I was prematurely kind of pushed off the team because a lot of my, my views were considered offensive and uh, not necessarily all that kind. And, and just for people to know, I'll, I'll tell my persuasion, I am a libertarian. I wasn't saying anything particularly, in my opinion, outrageous. It is a viewpoint held by many Americans. Um, it is a viewpoint that is based in hundreds of years of enlightenment uh, thinking. Um, well, yeah. So, but you know, but for them, it was not that. For them, it was. It had to do with their existences. It had to do with who they were as people, not who the ideas were in the objective world. So, my experience, and really, I've kind of been on a quest in my journey to become a political commentator to really, you know, shine a light on this issue the best that I can with my limited stature at the moment. And because I, I don't think that I don't think that critical discussion in America should be reduced to who's more oppressed, should be reduced to who's more black or white or whatever, or should be reduced to these sort of broader meta concepts that have nothing to do with anything beyond a particular ideological persuasion. So I'm very, very happy to be here and hope you guys have questions and thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Great. And uh, Christian, are you still in, uh, still studying? Yes, right? sir. I am currently a junior in college right now. Yes, sir. Excellent. Are there any questions for Christian in the chat? And if not, we'll move on to a more general discussion, including everyone's ideas. Mm -hmm. I see one hand up here. I'm trying to do this the best I can. Uh, this is Sue Hamola. Sue, I'm going to, uh, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Sue Hamala is uh, a representative from Hollis, New Hampshire, which is borders Massachusetts on the southern southern end. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Keith. Um, I just want to say, uh, just to start, thank you all for taking the time to uh, to give us your perspective and give us a little education. Uh, one of the things that I feel like that I do regularly when people are, um, you know, I get a lot of information, a lot of emails that say, you know, don't support this. You know, you're gonna you're gonna start preventing teachers from talking about important topics and things like that. And you know, and I routinely go back and say, well, you know, critical race theory is this in in two sentences, and this doesn't prevent this, this, and this. Do you? Does anybody there, particularly Christian, do you have any recommendations for where you go in the conversation? when you're dealing with people that it's just complete misinformation at that point 
and you're not even having a debate about finer points, but where do you, what's the first best step to take it, that conversation so that you're never gonna make people understand, but somebody listening might understand somebody else, you know, that's involved in this conversation. Like right now in our town, there's a Warren article petition on the school board to prevent this. It was uh, to prevent critical race theory from being taught. And you can't imagine like the craziness going on in our town right now about how this blew up. And there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of fear mongering and hate mongering and just, I'm looking for any recommendations other than what I've been doing. You know, if you have anything to add to that, thank you. Chris Ruffo, of course. Yeah, yeah I'll help. I'll, I'll give you kind of two pieces of information that I think are, are really important. Um, you know, I, I was actually the investigative reporter that broke the stories last year that led to the executive order under the Trump administration. I worked closely with them and also with James and, and Mike. Um, but th there are two things I think you need to do in educating your constituents and then also uh, you know, defending yourself in a debate is first is use specifics. So you can go to my website. It's ChristopherRufo.com. You can go to City Journal and look at my archive of articles, and and just say, you know, it's not about uh, it's not about kind of <clears throat> diversity and equity. This is what they do in real life, and I'll give you a few examples. Uh, they forced first graders in Cupertino, California, to deconstruct their sexual and racial identities, and then rank themselves according to their power and privilege. So taking four and five-year-olds and telling them that you are the oppressors and you are the oppressed. Uh, they had fifth graders in Philadelphia celebrate black communism and then simulate an Angela Davis black power rally to free her from prison where she had been held for murder um, and then uh, denouncing the president of the United States. Uh, or uh, a curriculum in Buffalo public schools where they said, quote, all white people contribute to systemic racism that white people uh, derive their wealth from slavery and they're unfairly rich and should be overthrown. Um, and then uh, in the in a California curriculum that is just a, put a story I put out yesterday, they are um, uh, they are having children uh, in the in the ethnic studies model curriculum chant to the Aztec god of human sacrifice to become social justice warriors. Um, so. Once you actually lay down the specifics, say, hey, it sounds great in theory. I support diversity. I support inclusion. I support equality. But this is what they're doing in practice. And then make your opponents defend those specific instances. And again, I can provide a range of reporting. I've been dumping a report out every two weeks of original source document reporting. You can refer them to City Journal and elsewhere. Do the you, second uh, question. Last, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was no, actually, go ahead. I was just going to ask, do you find that the DEI initiative is sort of a way to obtusely crack open the door for critical race theory? Because that's what it seems like to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, because, it's not even cracking open the door. It's blowing the door wide open. And uh, right. a lot of these programs, this is where they originate. Uh, the DEI or, or, or you know, DNI, depending on how you, uh, how, what institution. Yeah, this is absolutely the kind of, it's the gateway institution for making all of these things mandatory. Um, can and I get? I, I think, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was just yeah. gonna. I, I was just gonna add on on um, any DEI initiatives in organizations. I think it's very important to understand that there are diversity training programs that organizations can do that are not based in critical race theory. Now, that's yeah. not to say they're the most effective things in the world. There's not a whole lot of data to support that any diversity training program is going to make organizations better or more equitable or more productive or any of those things. But you know, it, it, they they don't do harm like critical race theory does. And I think it's very important. Anytime someone says that this bill would ban diversity training, that is not true. There are trainings that would be perfectly acceptable. That's exactly right. And, and we can, can I jump in one second? I'm sorry. I just, want to, I just want to connect the dots because uh, House Bill 544 is based off of the executive order that I think, uh, Chris, you helped write and some others helped write. It doesn't mention critical race theory in the bill. What it lists are the fundamental tenets of critical race theory. It's the granular level of what this theory promotes. And so don't get confused about the bill not having that term in it, uh, it mentions. Uh, Mike, you've had your hand up for it a little bit. And then I see you, Christian. Um, you guys want to go? In that order? Yeah. What I wanted to add, uh, Ms. Hamola and to others, <clears throat> is that there is a purpose to this. The purpose truly is to dismantle society. All the proponents of this do not like capitalism, are very open about it. This is not me saying it. This is them saying it. I can provide you all the quotes. I can provide you where they say these things. 
their aim, their goal, they say themselves, is to change society thoroughly. Uh, and and if, if a foreign power were doing this to us, we would go to war with it. So I am I'm very happy and ready to help any of you because the energy obviously now is in the state capitals. This is about defending a, a, a system, an American system that is imperfect. Of course, we, we can always try to work to perfect the American system, but I can tell you as somebody who has lived in eight different countries, traveled widely as a foreign correspondent, this is still the, 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 the freest, most prosperous country in the world and they denigrated this. This critical race theory is about tearing it down and denigrating it to put in something else. So you could say that to your critics, if you like. And I can help you, by the way, substantiate this. So can James, so can Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sue. Christian, you'd like to say? Yeah, yeah. Just just to address her, her initial question was, you know, how do we kind of, in an argument, how would you deal with this kind of stuff? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of one of my favorite platonic dialogues, the Gorgias, where, you know, Socrates is talk, talking, you know, trying to sift through a lot of things with a sophist. And I, I think it goes back to what Aristotle called first philosophy, because really, I think Mr. Gonzalez or Dr. Gonzalez, my, my apologies, is, is absolutely is absolutely correct. I think he's absolutely correct when he says that the fundamental tenet, the sort of overarching understanding of reality that is being posited through critical race theory stuff is what this bill talks about. And that, in my opinion, that's where this where this fight needs to happen on both the political realm and in the social realm, because look, we can look at individual instances all the time, all, all we want. We can look at the school stuff. We can look at, but if the overarching principles are not addressed, those instances will simply repopulate and reproduce elsewhere. So what you do is you simply engage with them like a Greek philosopher did, ask questions. Because I, I genuinely believe that most people who follow this critical race they do so out of a dedication to emotionalism and not to logic. Number one, because critical race theory fundamentally rejects logic as a vestige of white supremacy. And number two, because issues are very much proximal to understandings of things that have to do with us intimately, race, skin color, sexuality. So what you simply do, instead of maybe trying to disprove um, you know, things on the basis of particular um, instances, which can be helpful in some cases, talk about, ask people why. Ask people, why do you believe this? Ask people, what are the undercurrents of your belief? And you, I think the more you ask questions, the more people are naturally forced to think and rethink their propositions. And if they aren't, then that's, I don't think they would, they would ever be any, of any help in the first place. <laughs> so that's my opinion. Great. That's a great I point. Want, I, just, I just want to recenter uh, the focus on the bill as, you know, including the bill. Um, one question, and, and I see your hand, uh, James Lindsay. One question we get, is, or one attack that we're getting, is this bill. Uh, this bill undermines the freedom of speech. So let's, uh, if we can incorporate that into the discussion, that would be helpful for the reps that are listening. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, Dr. Lindsay, would you like to go? Yeah, please. Um, I can speak to that. Let me just jump in and chat about whether this is actually a plot to undermine America and what it's really really about. I want to read to you a very short section, and I just mean a couple sentences from Herbert Marcuse's 1969 essay uh, called An Essay on Liberation, uh, where he tells you what the point of the project is. And Herbert Marcuse was the PhD advisor to Angela Davis, who's working in the prison abolition movement and works with critical race theory now. Just as a little background, just a couple sentences. Be able to overrate the present chances of these forces, uh, but the facts are there, facts which will not only, uh, not only the symbols, but also the embodiment of hope. They confront the critical theory of society. So critical race theory is a critical theory of society with the task of re-examining the prospects for the emergence of a socialist society qualitatively different from existing societies, the task of redefining socialism and, pre and its preconditions. And he says that this all follows a great refusal of the capitalist society the proper noun that he uses a lot. But as far as that's just, this really is a plot to undermine America as uh, Mike uh, Gonzalez pointed out. But as far as the free speech issue goes, it's very important to understand that this is, um, this is not a legitimate complaint that they're making because the bill has provisions if it mirrors to the degree that it mirrors the executive order issued by President Trump to allow the teaching of critical race theory if it's taught as one theory among many uh, not as uncontested fact. It allows for diversity training, racial sensitivity training, so long as they don't rely on these granular level um, divisive tenants, which uh, Representative Ammon pointed out 
you know, ban the certain practices of critical race theory, but if you read them, they also ban practices that would be of white supremacy and of patriarchy and miso institutionalized misogyny as well. In other words, this bill is a reiteration of some of the key things that are happening within civil rights law. Um, it's a little bit ironic that they bring up a free speech defense for this, seeing as, as I told you, um, the critical race theory itself is openly critical and skeptical of the idea of rights on page 23 of a book titled Critical Race Theory by Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk. They tell you that they are openly skeptical of the idea of rights on page three. They tell you that they are, uh, they call into question equality theory and the neutral principles of constitutional law. So you literally have them saying that they are not interested in rights, but they're going to use rights to def their claim to rights to defend their right to destroy rights. Yeah. Uh, that's literally their project and it's in their own words and the citations are there um, pages 23 and three in the, this, this book that is titled Critical Race Theory. Um, that said, uh, like I said, the, the bill actually allows for diversity training, racial sensitivity training, inclusion training, uh, teaching critical race theory as an academic subject, but not as uncontested facts, so long as it doesn't lead with these and treat these divisive concepts as uncontested fact. Therefore, it's consistent already with uh, free speech. It also uh, is consistent with academic freedom for, for people in colleges that care about this. This comes out of tax. This is only addressing people that are, are teaching this stuff on taxpayer money as well. So it doesn't infringe private citizens rights to do this. This is a question of what the state is allowed to do and not allowed to do. Um, it's a reiteration of the civil rights. You saw the thing from Coca-Cola that, that uh, Dr. Carlin shared, and it you know explicitly scapegoats the white race very clearly there. So racial scapegoating is one of the divisive tenets that's not allowed. Another very important that freedom of speech includes not just the freedom to be able to speak, but also the freedom not to be compelled, especially by the state to speak. So if you're in a if you're in a workplace training like Chris Chris is uh, detailed Chris Rufo's detailed or Carlin pointed out, and they compel you to say that you are complicit in racism, systemic racism as a white person, that is compelled speech. The state is compelling that speech at that point. So they are the ones that are actually bidding to violate the First Amendment by hiding behind a bogus claim that their First Amendment rights would be violated. Uh, secondly, there's freedom of conscience, the Establishment Clause and the uh, Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment imply freedom of conscience. It's not a strict argument since critical race theory is not deemed a religion, but one should be able to have the freedom of conscience to assess issues of race and racism on one's own terms and not to have those dictated by the state. That's of course a little bit of a weaker argument, uh, but most Americans believe in equality theory. They believe in Martin Luther King's vision of colorblind uh, judgment by character, not by color of skin. And to be told that they now have to think differently on the taxpayer dime seems to be a violation of that. And if those people happen to be Christians, it violates depending on their Christian faith, which of course there are many different ways that that can be done. But I've spoken with a Christian attorney about this and he said he's hungry to start suing. So watch out. Uh, it violates the First Amendment right to not be compelled in your religion by your employer, especially when that employer is a state, because, for example, Christianity contains the idea of neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, etc., all one in Christ Jesus, and therefore it is a religious tenet of Christianity not to judge by the color of one's skin, not to racially scapegoat, stereotype, or discriminate. Uh, whether Christians have lived up to that or not, they do have the ability to claim their religious freedom not to be told that they have to think differently about race and to think in racialized terms um, if they so choose. So there are a number of ways in which this is actually the, the claim that it violates their free speech, while that might be something a lawyer could nitpick in the language. And I know a lawyer named David P Piptoric who knows how to get around that injunction that was filed in Northern California if we need to tweak the language or whatever. That, that, that deals with contractors specifically. Is that what it is? I, I, I actually don't know. He hasn't given so. me the brief. But it's not, it, it deals with, there's a, all right, great. Um, I just wanted to uh, throw this out and then we'll go to uh, Chris Rufo. Um, we see the other side evolving their attacks against this bill. And this is important because I believe there are four other states uh, attempting a bill similar to this now. They first called it racist, they called it uh, transphobic, and they started with that attack and it didn't, it didn't uh, click with Republicans because what they're trying to do is peel off enough of our Republican caucus 
uh, I know there's nonpartisan organizations on this call, but they're, they're trying, so they, they came up with the uh, attack against free speech and that seems to ring true in Republican ears as it should because we care about free speech. So that's what we're seeing this evolving attack. Uh, Chris Rufo, would you like to jump in and then we'll go to Representative Renzula. I see your hand up. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just bewildered that they would say it's anti-trans. I haven't heard that. I, I don't, there's nothing in it that would even touch on any of those issues, very bizarre. Um, but uh, I, I think the free speech question, I dropped a link in to uh, Liberty Unyielding piece from uh, my colleague Hans Bader who gives the, the First Amendment case. And I, I think that that's a line of attack that they've tried in the New York Times and elsewhere. And it's just, I mean, it, it's, it's absurd. Uh, the government does not have a right to free speech. Uh, we have a right to free speech as American individuals against the government. Uh, the government can't say whatever it wants. And, and in fact, as legislators, you are duty bound to constrain the speech of government, to have a correct speech and right speech that reflects the value of voters. Um, I mean, it's just completely totalitarian to say that the government has the right to unlimited speech. You should ask your democratic colleagues uh, to say, okay, great. Well, should we have a, a training session mandatory for all New Hampshire state employees on 10 reasons why abortion is always evil and wrong? Well, they're gonna say, well, no, you can't say that. You can say, well, why? It's not appropriate in the workplace. And that's really what I think the key is, is you as legislators decide what is appropriate in the workplace. Is it appropriate to say that all white people are inherently evil because of the color of their skin? Is it appropriate to divide employees into groups of oppressor and oppressed uh, based on where they were born? Of course it isn't. It's probably illegal, but what this bill does is make sure that any kind of diversity training focuses on bringing people together, not dividing them. And then the, the second point is that the 14th Amendment, which provides protection against discrimination, outweighs the First Amendment. So you don't have a right to say anything you want. The state does not have a right to discriminate against people or use discriminatory speech. So you just have to say, hey, look, the 14th Amendment outweighs the First Amendment. The government doesn't have unlimited First Amendment rights. And with schools particularly, the Supreme Court has ruled repeatedly uh, that you can restrict curricular speech without restricting free speech. Again, in fact, it is incumbent upon you as legislative leaders to craft the kind of programs and policies and government official speech uh, that is both legal and consonant with your values. So uh, don't be fooled by the free speech argument. It's, uh, it's flimsy at its core. Keith, can I just say one quick thing? Sure, jump in. So, um, so just if anyone has any questions about whether or not this speech is actually being compelled in organizations, there is a whistleblower that's about to get fired from the University of Vermont for talking about what they're doing there because it is all over UVM. And he was telling me the other night that he throws up every single Sunday when he has to anticipate going to work because he is constantly terrified of saying the wrong thing and being held to account by his colleagues over and over and over again because they will nitpick any single thing that you say. This, this ideology when it's in, ingrained into organizations, whether contracts or whatever, um, it creates more anxiety, it creates more depression, it creates more interpersonal conflict, people are constantly on edge. And what it does is it actually reduces psychological safety on the team. And psychological safety is the number one driver of productive organizations. That's all. Great. Yeah, and we'll, we'll throw a link to that video in the chat. Um, I'll do it as, as soon as I can pull it up, unless someone else has it. But that was a recent whistleblower from the University of Vermont. And going back to this free speech, the compelled speech issue, I thought it was interesting in his comments. Uh, he made a, a, an open video to the University of Vermont, a public university, just like you know, University of New Hampshire. Um, but he said it, it made him spiritually sick to have to confess these ideas. And I thought that was very interesting comment that your right of conscience uh, is so important that it can affect your physical health. As, as Carlin, you mentioned, he was throwing up. So, you know, this is important stuff we're talking about. Um, Mike, did you have your hand up? I was going to add, uh, I, I always say, obviously, you know, being mean or, or being against one race is illegal and it's bad in itself. But the reason to be against critical race theory it's because it's, it, what it tries to do is introduce central planning in, 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 in a Marxist system that is bad for all races. It's not because it's mean to whites. It's because it tries to change America. And inter, as, 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 as James and Chris have said, it tries to, it's going to be bad for everybody. 
and 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 it, it doesn't really hide that this is its goal. As Chris, as James said, we can we can any if any of you has ever has any questions, just email us, and we'll give you all the all the all the the, the ballast, uh, the rhetorical ballast you will need in this regard. Excellent. I'm getting some comments that were going a little too fast. So uh, if anybody has a uh, like a basic question, don't be afraid to ask a basic question in the chat or if you'd like to speak on the video, I'll just throw that out there. Um, it's hard to keep up with all the galaxy brains on the call here. <laughs> Who would like to continue the conversation? You know, I, I'm kind of curious about the executive order and the origins of that because this bill borrows, um, you know, maybe 75% of the language uh, from that executive order, at least the general idea. So uh, some background on how that came about would be interesting to me. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I did a series of investigative reports on critical race theory in federal agencies. So for one example, they took the nuclear weapons engineers at Sandia National Labs. Uh, it took them white male engineers to a three-day white male uh, re-education retreat. Uh, they told them that they had to deconstruct their white male culture, that it was, an, uh, it was synonymous with the KKK and lynchings uh, and slave owning and other historical injustices. Uh, then they had to renounce their own white male Christian identity and then write letters of apology to women and people of color. Um, I, I broke a number of stories like that. They were doing intersectionality training at the FBI. Uh, the Treasury Department denounced the United States as a fundamentally racist country, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I did a uh, opening monologue, a, a joint monologue with Tucker Carlson. Uh, the president saw it, um, uh, responded to the call, had his team, had his chief of staff call me the next day and their White House put together the executive order in about three weeks because uh, I had laid out a case of all these stories from a, a dozen federal agencies. I've now done it in more than a dozen school districts showing exactly what this ideology does to divide people, uh, to assign guilt based on race uh, and truly to create a toxic working environment and, uh, and, and opposing the institutions of this country. So. Um, they took it on and, and frankly, they had the courage to do it. And I'd like to tell everyone on this call, um, it's going to take courage to do this, but it's the right thing to do. And it's going to be a popular thing to do. And, uh, you know, I don't think other administrations would have tackled this issue. I'm really glad that you're tackling it. Um, you're going to take some heat for it. Uh, but the more that you can educate your constituents on what it prevents, all it does, it prevents it prevents racial stereotyping, scapegoating, and discrimination. It prevents the Klan from doing it. It also prevents the CRT advocates from doing it. Um, and uh, it's going to take courage. And I just, uh, I hope that you guys can summon that courage and that steely resolve, uh, just like the folks in the White House, and get this thing done. Yeah, just, to, just to add real quick to that, I just want to emphasize the point that Chris just made, because I think everyone that, that fights back against this ideology, we all pay a price for fighting back against it, but we do it because it is the absolute right thing to do. If you ever had any questions about what you would have done in Germany leading up to the Holocaust or what you would have done during the civil rights movement, what you are doing right now is the answer to that question. This is an existential threat to this country, and this is not even a left or right issue. This, this is about doing what is right and having the courage of your convictions to stand up for it. And if you guys do, you will receive so much support you cannot imagine. Uh, Keith, if I could just add something to that. Sure. This is a very key point. This is not a left or right issue. We have many people on the left, like Glenn Greenwald, like, like uh, Barry Weiss, uh, like uh, uh, Andrew Sullivan, uh, Steven Pinker, with whom I disagree at Harvard on many, many, many things. But he likes liberal democracy, and he understands that we need to stand up for liberal democracy. And right. he understands that to take to tell a black child the classic that, the classic definition of liberal, right? right. And to, yeah. but to, he, he, these people on the left understand that to tell a black child that it is a white thing to le to love to read and write, that it is a white thing to work hard, that it is a white thing to be punctual, it's a form of child abuse. Right. So, so this is not, again, I think Carlin put it exactly right. This is not a left or right thing. Excellent. Now we're going to pull in some Q&A here. We have Representative uh, Bob Lynn. And Bob, would you give a brief introduction? You can unmute now. Hi. Uh, uh, 
My name's Bob Lynn. Um, I'm uh, a, a brand new state representative, but um, I was uh, formerly the chief justice of the state Supreme Court here for uh, a while and served on the court for about eight and a half years in total. And I, I, I found this, I find your presentations to be very, very helpful and, and very, um, uh, very insightful. I, I couldn't agree more with what uh, you, you have all expressed. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about, and I, I think uh, Keith has also, I think we've both sort of heard these rumors that uh, the governor is not, has expressed some concern about this. And I, I, my impression is that the, you know, that the, the, this is a sort of reaction on the part of the governor, uh, just sort of an offhand reaction that he, that he hasn't really looked at this and studied it carefully and asked his lawyers to look at it carefully. But, um, you know, it, it, because this, I completely agree with you that this is not a free speech issue because you're talking about the, about government speech and the, and the, the, the state can clearly regulate and tell the government what its speech is supposed to be. But nonetheless, I think that there's, um, because it deals with speech, it's kind of easy if you don't look at it carefully to, you know, to say, oh, well, this is trying to, you know, tell teachers what to do. And, you know, and, and it, it maybe requires a, a, a somewhat more careful review to say, well, yes, it does, but there's nothing wrong with that. And so I'm just wondering if you, based upon your experience, and I really direct this question to any of you, do you have any strategies as, you know, as to how, how you think uh, the, the best way to kind of get people to look more, more critically at, um, at the issue uh, so that they come to their correct conclusion? You'd like to take that one. I mean, uh, if I oh, I'm sorry, Christian. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, again, I, I I think that again, a lot of a lot of people, I think a lot of people basically want the same thing at a fundamental level, but they have different ways of expressing it. Uh, and that's why that's why there are people who may be leftist or right right wing people who may want to fight on this issue. So I think that people who may be in the middle, who may be unfamiliar, or who are familiar, and may think that the uh, there are certain historical things in America that warrant serious conversation. And all they're hearing right now is the version of how to have that conversation from the critical race theory people. I think you just ask them, you say, okay, look, here's what we're dealing with here. Um, this, this sort of mechanism here doesn't really want us to have an open conversation that is able to challenge and look for things. It already, critical, critical race theory presupposes an answer, then tries to force that answer down onto you um, by this academic mechanism. So I think you really just expose how there is no inquisitiveness. There is no process of searching and discovery. There is no learning when you have this academic mechanism here. All you have is a certain story, a, a static story, if I might say, and a story that is presupposed to be correct. And how in the world can you engage with that? So if someone believes free speech, they, they obviously they believe in engagement. And so you can't have engagement when you have an ideology that tries to explain the whole of society. And, and the whole and, and the very integral character of the American experiment through you, through one lens and any, any, and any other way to engage with that for that ideology is tantamount to racism or whatever they might say it is. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just gonna throw one thing out real quick. Um, we had a, an experience of a parent in our state in, in Hanover, but a parent was raising an issue in that school district about critical race theory and he was interrupted and shouted, basically stopped from speaking. And the person that did that said, I'm trained to do that. I'm trained to be a professional interrupter and shut down because I know what you're doing. And so I'm gonna sh shut you down from speaking. That's part of this uh, dogma is to stop other people from giving a counter viewpoint. And uh, James, Lin Lindsay, we'll pull you in. I have uh, Gary Hopper up too, so Gary, would you just give a brief question and then James, would you mind incorporate? I know you have to go in uh, 15 minutes, but Gary, you're next. And I'm assuming this is Gary Hopper. Uh, yeah, uh, just, just a quick one. To me, um, I've, I've synthesized critical race theory down to the idea that it's fundamentally a ad hominem argument. 
The only way we made grounds over the years on the Second Amendment is not by explaining to people the necessity of balance of power between the federal government and the people and, and all that. It, it seems like the only thing that worked were simple, um, simple arguments, you know, like uh, the simplest one is, you know, if, if, if you know, if only, uh, uh, if, if the crim if whoever has guns, only the criminals will have guns and, and stupid little sound bites that you know intellectually don't mean anything but it worked so you have a question? I think if Gary, what, what's yeah, your question for the panelists i'm sorry to interrupt yeah the question is what what um sound bites can we start using against critical race theory because explaining it and rationalizing isn't gonna isn't going to get us anywhere we need like sound bites that say you know uh um to try to start com combating this one, one soundbite that I think has worked well in my experience is racism is always wrong and has no place in our public institutions. Yeah. And then, and then another, and then as a follow-up, say, hey, look, the beauty of this bill is that it would prevent the Ku Klux Klan from organizing a school curriculum, and it would also prevent the critical theorists from organizing a curriculum. Racism from the left or the right is always wrong. Yeah. How I've, how I've explained it um, in a really quick way is to say that Martin Luther King said that we should judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Critical race theory does exactly the opposite. It tries to reverse Martin Luther King to say we only should judge people by the color of their skin rather than the content of their character. Mr. Lindsay, you, you were- uh, Yeah. Well, you I mean, I can back up what, what Carlin just said also. The idea of having these these things that you're talking about are actually de detailed by Robert J. Lifton, who is a cult expert and dealt with the, the cult and the cultural revolution in China. And he explains that they're called thought stopping techniques. Uh, it, it is a deliberate technique activists are trained in and use, uh, and they have to be answered by kind of the, the same sort of thing. And the ones that, that were just presented are great. It's useful, by the way, to know that the slogan during or one of the major slogans during the civil rights movement in 1963 was I am a man. The sign said I am a man. It didn't say I am black. It said I am a man. Uh, so it was a call to colorblindness. There's a Memphis, there's a, mem a memorial to that in Memphis, which you can look up online since you're in New Hampshire and probably won't see it in person anytime soon. But uh, what I wanted to say was something to, to Bob's question just a moment ago um, is, is that the only thing that I've ever found that works to get people to understand what's happening is that you have to give examples. You have to show, not tell. Uh, you have to show this is what happened at Coca-Cola. This is what happened at Sandia National Laboratory. This is what's happening in the California schools where they're literally making people chant to the Aztec god of death or, what, or whatever it is. This is actually what's happening. And then with the theory, these, this is why I did that when I spoke earlier. These are the actual quotes. For that purpose, the book Critical Race Theory and Introduction, which is a short, easy to read book at the undergraduate textbook level. I can send the title so it's easy to remember. It takes, it's like 170 pages. The first 30 pages are just an overwhelming treasure trove of explaining what critical race theory is. And then you can pull out and say, no, it openly says that it's against the concept of rights on page 23. It openly said, here's the sentence. It openly says it's against the concept of constitutional neutrality on page three. Here's the sentence, et cetera, et cetera. And when you show people and you say, this isn't a fringe book, this is the standard textbook that tends to get people to realize something is badly wrong here. And if you connect that to practical examples, like where they're making kids line up according to their privilege, or where I've been contacted by about 3,000 mostly uh, uh, Indian American women, primarily, but they have to go through these things now called brown fragility training, where they're to interrogate their anti-blackness as a brown person and then to explain their, their compelled, compelled speech to deal with their feelings of defensiveness around having to do this if they don't want to participate. Um, when you can give concrete examples and you know any one of us on the panel would have a bunch of those. When you can give concrete examples, people connect with it. So we should include that in a, in a handout, I, I think for sure for the reps. Uh, I'm gonna to bring Tony, Representative Tony Likas in and Mike, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to fill in something that? Uh, uh, yeah, just quickly. One of the, the arguments that uh, proponents of theory use is that they're being compassionate and they're trying to address uh, centuries of oppression and so forth. 
but that is actually just just not true because they don't want individual success. They are on the record as saying they don't want individual success because that is the individual and his family or her family joining the system. What they want is collective effort to destroy the system. So we can we can meet that argument right away when they say you're just not being compassionate. No, they're not being compassionate. They don't want individual success. They want to change the system. This is what they want. You know, I used to hear the term uh, systematic racism, and I used to think, well, that sounds reasonable because uh, there is racism. You know, the, sometimes the police are racist, or you know, and they have been for decades, right? But what they really mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the fundamental roots of our American system, going back to the signing of the Declaration of Independence, have been to perpetuate racism and sexism. All the structure of those institutions are designed to perpetuate racism and sexism. And that in order to get rid of it, we have to fundamentally uproot and, uh, and re remake our entire system that's really what they're calling for when they say that term. Uh, yes, if, if you believe that America is systemically, institutionally and structurally racist, then the only logical conclusion is to change the institutions, the structures and the system, which is a fancy word for the way everything works. Uh, and the reason why they must denigrate the founding and the founding documents is because that, that constitution, that old constitution gets in the way of the, of the things they want to do. So they, I just had a debate on NPR the other day and, and with a professor at Georgetown. And the first thing he said when I said, well, the constitution won't allow you to do that. He said, well, the constitution also said that I was uh, uh, three fifths human. And of course he's misrepresenting that because it was obviously the slave owners who wanted to have five fifths. This was a measure to limit the power of the slave owners and the racists. So we have to know the facts to be able to counter them right away, uh, because we can, we have the facts, and we have, we have goodness on our side, I believe. Excellent, Christian. I saw your hand up. I want to bring to uh, Tony Likas in. Tony, your audio uh, was scary a few seconds ago, so I'm going to unmute you, and hopefully, it doesn't uh, freak us out. How's the audio now? Sounds great. Okay. Uh, first, just a quick comment on what was just uh, recently said, and that is, to the extent there are examples that can be brought up that occurred in New Hampshire, those would be uh, tremendously more powerful. I mean, among reps, I've seen a, a, the reaction often of uh, hearing some problem that occurred elsewhere, and it's like, well, this is New Hampshire, that wasn't here. So right. it's much more effective if you can find examples that are here. People uh, are afraid to talk about this, and... Uh... People are afraid to talk about this. So hopefully as more people do talk about it, people get the courage to come out and give more examples uh, instead of just, you know, whispering about it. Um, Tony, well, I, I can give a couple examples that I know of just off the top of my head, honestly. So BAE Systems right now is doing an entire um, assessment on their of their employee salary to uh, make sure that salaries are equitable with an emphasis on the salaries of women and um, and people that are not white. So this is this is actively in BAE right now. They have they rolled out a whole diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative um, a couple of months ago that was specifically geared towards this. And again, I also mentioned that I, I the uh, the book White Fragility was absolutely 100% used in training in the Bedford schools um, over the summer. Now it was billed as an optional training. But what happens when people have optional white fragility trainings or white fragility book clubs is that it's not really optional because if you don't participate, you are labeled as a racist by your colleagues and could potentially lose your job. So those are just two examples. Off white, fr head. white fragility, just uh, so pe if people haven't heard of that book. Um... How would you describe it? Um, it is essentially so. Uh, it's by uh, a woman named Robin D'Angelo. It is one. It was the best-selling book over the summer, and essentially the whole premise of the book, White Fragility, uh, and Robin D'Angelo literally says this in the book. She says, "I have been racist since the womb." She says that all white people are racist from birth. They are racist their entire lives. They will always be racist. She has this whole section where she does a dramatic confession uh, to her colleagues of all the racist acts that she's committed. Um, this is the the Bible of, of like, you know, pop culture, uh, critical race theory. It's used in trainings everywhere. And, in a, and to some of the points that were made about um, systemic racism and teaching that America is a fundamentally racist country, that's, you know, that is manifest in this book. It says all white people 
everywhere are racist. They do not do anything to help people who are not white. And just to add one more note about that is it's, you know, it's presented as this scholarly work, but if you look in the work, there's actually very limited scholarly references. It's not backed up by anything. Some of the chapters have no scholarly references at all. And it's just based on Robin De what, what has come out of Robin D'Angelo's head and onto the page. I've got to jump off of here in just a second because I have another prior mm -hmm. commitment, but I want to add to what what was just said about white fragility where uh, where she says that she had that incident and it is described in the book where she confesses to everybody her racism. This is actually something that's kind of a mainstay in these uh, critical race theory based trainings. When I mentioned the brown fragility training a moment ago, they often do force people at work to confess to their colleagues about their racist intent, which then you can imagine how comfortable people are working in that environment after that point. Uh, you've now had a number of people who all of whom maybe that are not black or that are willing to participate in this have to be forced to confess to their colleagues. Yeah, by the way, I was secretly really racist my whole life and I kind of still have some racist thoughts and see at work tomorrow. Um, I've heard so many people tell me that that's absolutely toxicified their working environment uh, it's even more severe with the issue around sex and sexuality, but we're not going to touch on that at the moment than with around race, but forcing people to confess their racism is a part and parcel of this. So any examples you can find in New Hampshire where that's happening, I guarantee you that's poisoning workplaces. And if that's happening through the, the compelled speech of the state, you've got a big problem on your hands. Um, sooner or later, the courts will probably catch up with this unless the revolution is successful. Uh, so Thank you for participating. I, it looks like Chris Rufo had to uh, take off as well. So thank you, Dr. Lindsay, for, for joining us today. We're gonna wrap this up soon. Tony Likas has one other question and then we'll have some final remarks. Hey, thank you. Um, so I was on the committee that, uh, that voted uh, for this and I've gotten something over a thousand emails on it. Thank you, Carlin, I think to some extent. But um, one of the questions, one of the issues that's been brought up is that you know, this uh, noting it is based on the uh, executive order. And also there was a statement, the executive order was found unconstitutional. So what are the details on that and, and what's really going on as far as the constitutionality of it? Yeah, so uh, James Lindsay addressed that earlier in our call. Uh, it was, uh, this is my understanding. So please do your own research. There's a, a portion that deals with contractors in, in the, the original executive order. And I believe that portion was found by a California, I think it's a circuit court judge, uh, that a piece was unconstitutional. They put a, uh, uh, what do you call it, injunction on it. Now the bill as 544 as it's written has a, a severability clause in it. So if any portion of it is found unconstitutional for some reason, the rest of the bill would remain intact. Um, and then, of course, uh, President Biden rescinded that, um, that emergency order, so I don't think it went any further than that court. That's my understanding, Tony. Thank you. Yeah, I would doubt that if it ever came to the Supreme Court, it would be found to be unconstitutional. The first executive order that mentions the words affirmative action was uh, Jack Kennedy's executive order nine, uh, 10925, which, which said that the government needed to take affirmative actions to make sure that government contractors were not making decisions based on race, uh, sex, or national origin. Of course, within a few short years, that was turned completely around, and affirmative action now means the opposite. Well, we still have Kennedy's executive order, I believe it was on early 1963, uh, 109.25, and, and since what we're trying to prevent here is racism, I don't see a problem with telling contractors they cannot engage in racism. Keith, I just want you to know I just promoted um, Jonathan into the chat because um, he has he has. Oh, excellent, <laughs> uh, Jonathan. Uh, so Jonathan had a prior commitment, but he he told us he'd join us at seven. We're only get, probably going to go for a few more minutes, Jonathan. But jump in with your introduction, and um, you know you're a, a, a fellow, I believe, at the Heritage Foundation. So, spotlight. Thank on you. That. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the introduction. I'm sorry I couldn't be here earlier. My name is Jonathan Butcher, and I'm the Will Skillman Research Fellow in Education at the Heritage Foundation. So I know that I missed uh, a lot of what was covered. So if there are any questions that are left dangling, or if there are, are, is a particular area that you'd like me to cover, I, I don't need to, to go back over ground that, that you guys have already 
uh, already been through. Excellent. And we're getting a lot of requests for, so our, pa our uh, attendees are, I think all of them, current state representatives in New Hampshire. So that's our audience tonight. And we're getting a lot of requests that they be given your contact info so they could reach out if they have further questions. Yes, right, please. Let's, let's go around with just final thoughts. Um, who'd like to kind of wrap things up and tie things together. We wanna to get House Bill 544 passed out of the House, passed out of the Senate, signed by the governor. That's that's our uh, our task at hand. Um, so any, any final thoughts on um, helping that process along? I have one. Uh, this video is going to be recorded and we're gonna send out a link to it. The governor has telegraphed that he wants changes in the bill. We need to know what those changes are. Um, I had a uh, party official in a GOP uh, say to me that if the governor vetoed this bill, it could start a very big schism in our party. So let's figure out how to come together and address this. Uh, and so that's addressed to the people on the call. I could use some help reaching out to the governor in a constructive way so that we can get something accomplished. So. Christian? Yeah, I just want to say again, thank you all for having me here. And really, I, I want us to just focus on, you know, the, the bill is the main thing, but I want us to focus on, you know, what the bill could possibly do. And really, this is simply about understanding that fundamentally, as Americans, there is some grain into our system of governance, which prides free interaction and prides the ability to be able to exist in a learning space without being bullied into accepting a certain point of view that, it, that comes from a very narrow um, place. And that's really what critical race theory is. So this is not about chilling free speech. This is not about doing any of that stuff. This is about simply paying an ode to the foundational tenet of American governance and all the state governments as well, which is simply the importance of free intellectual inquiry. And by passing this bill, I genuinely think the people of New Hampshire will be able to have um, that their their process of free inquiry unimpeded um, by any by you know critical race theory any of the forces that may be prevalent in the education system today. So that's just my final thoughts. And again, thank you guys so much for having me. That's great, Christian. And you gave your experience earlier how it, this uh, ideology is chilling debate within university, uh, and what a problem that is for having uh, young people graduate with the critical thinking skills that they need. So. We appreciate your experience in that area. Um, Jonathan, I, I feel like we shortchanged you. So do you wanna uh, say anything on the way out here? No, not at all. I was the one that uh, that couldn't make it for the, for the regular time. I see a question in the chat here that says, we just need examples of what critical race theory requires of people. And I'm not sure how much discussion there was about uh, what uh, research there has been on diversity trainings. Was there a conversation about that earlier in, the, in your call tonight? Just a little bit. Mm -hmm. but. So I would I would add, and I'd be glad to provide more information to people uh, on the call here, but there is significant research that has found that diversity or anti-bias or otherwise these um, multicultural trainings that are done in businesses and now in schools um, are not effective at changing attitudes or, or behavior. So there are hundreds, in fact, of studies that find that these programs are extremely um, expensive, uh, but they are not effective at causing lasting change, even after a few hours or even a few days when the researchers return to ask the participants um, with their different measures of tolerance, right? So they have indicators by which they can measure someone's attitude or perspective on a particular issue. So um, there, is, uh, there was a report from Harvard uh, just a couple of years ago that pointed this out. And um, I, I think more importantly in the issue in the, uh, in the area of education, there was a report from Education Week, uh, which is uh, very much um, you know, uh, down the center, uh, if not a little to the left uh, uh, trade publication, where they acknowledge that uh, it is, these trainings are not effective at changing people's minds. And so that's really important to know, right? Because this is an $8 billion industry in the private sector. And I'm not, you know, we don't even know uh, really total what it's, it happens in the public sector. So uh, that's, uh, that's really important. And uh, there's a comment here that says it would make the workplace more confrontational. And it's actually true. One of the, one of the, some of the studies have found that when people are 
um, asked uh, about uh, their feelings on this, or if they are they're, um, if they are asked about this issue of whiteness, it actually does create resentment. Thing that I'll end with in the, in the final thought here is there actually was a comment in the article uh, by these Harvard researchers who said it was actually more effective to talk about the very idea of colorblindness, which is huge. I and mean, that's not a small thing because that is precisely what critical race theory uh, was um, dismissive of from the civil rights movement. That's something that critical race theory was engineered um, to uh, to respond against was this idea of colorblindness. So it's the opposite that concept is really important that that was more effective. Sorry to cut you off. It, it was the, it's the opposite of colorblindness, right? It's uh, it's putting a hyper focus on on color and differences. And, and Keith, I'll, I'd like to build my final statement off of um, what Jonathan just said, because there is also research to show that organizations are actually better off doing nothing than doing training based on this ideology. So just letting the employees be, I can tell you from direct experience I have with working with employees and organizations that do this stuff is they are terrified. They are terrified to speak up. They are terrified to go into work every single day. It is destroying workplaces. And the reality is that even with all the research we have on it, there, there could probably be a lot more research, except for the fact that the American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric Association right now is inhibiting research into this area. They are inhibiting these studies from being published because it does not go along with this ideology. So that's another thing that we have to contend with is that the only research that's even uh, allowed to make, make the life of day in these organizations that are governing an entire field of psychology is organ is research that aligns with what they want you to hear. Um, you know, I also just want to touch briefly on uh, how this manifests in schools because we didn't really get into that so much today. But uh, I sat in on a teacher training program about a month ago uh, that was teaching teachers how to deal with these issues of diversity in the classroom. And it was, someone brought up the example of what do you do with biracial children? Children have a white parent and a non-white parent. And do you know what the teacher training actually taught them? It taught the teachers to tell the children to identify with the non-white part of themselves, but not the white part of themselves. That's insane. This, this is actively making its way into the classroom in that form. It is an incredibly, incredibly dangerous ideology. And I just, I really hope that everyone on this call and that watches the recording has the courage to stand up to it. I know it is not easy. You will be called a racist. You will be called every name in the book, but trust me, it is worth it at the end of the day because we have to stand up and do what's right. All right, excellent. We're gonna wrap this up. Uh, Mike, do you have any final thoughts? Thank you for your time tonight. Oh, anytime. Uh, I love New Hampshire. I love New England. Uh, fighting this is the right thing to do. This is fighting institutionalized racism and you're doing the right thing. I want to underline what Carlin just said. Don't, don't listen to the things they call you. I don't. You're doing the right thing in fighting critical race theory uh, on, the, on, the, on the color blindness thing. Ibram X. Kendi and, and, and all the others actually say that to, to talk about colorblindness and to try to be, to try to not see color is racist. Obviously a, a, a contradiction, every time you have a contradiction, there's a reason, uh, but they say that that, that that is a racist thing. Thank, and thank you very, mu very much for having me on, uh, Keith. I hope I've been able to Excellent. help. Excellent, yeah, no, thank you for, you, you guys uh, offered to help with this call, so I appreciate that. And Christian, nice to meet you. Uh, any final thoughts? I think you, you already said your goodbyes, but uh, any final thoughts from you? Nope. Okay, excellent. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to all our attendees. Uh, and we'll get this uh, disseminated out to uh, our other colleagues. I know some had prior engagements, they weren't able to make it. So we'll make sure they hear this too. All right. And thank you, Carlin, for helping with uh, putting this all together. I really appreciate it. Okay, bye, everybody.